Welcome to our next episode of uh, Under the Bonnet. We're going to be looking this week at chapter 36 and 37 um, of Isaiah. Andy preached it on Sunday. Uh, Andy, just give us a brief introduction to what you were talking about. You're going to read uh, chapter 37 in a minute. Um, and this is chapter 36, which is basically uh, Jerusalem has been surrounded by the Assyrians. Uh, Sennacherib, uh, Sennacherib, their king, is um, uh, attacking, and King Hezekiah of, of Judah is the one who's defending. And uh, the field commander for Sennacherib comes to um, basically Hezekiah's officials on the wall and starts to intimidate them. And uh, he he runs through different things that they might be depending on Hezekiah's fancy words, Egypt or maybe it's the Lord, and he makes the point that the Lord won't save you, Um, but then he says um, the Lord can't save you. And the response from those on the wall is silence because they've been told to be quiet. And then we pick up at chapter 37. Mm. So 37 verse 1. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country. And there I will have him cut down with a sword. When the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Tihaka, the king of Cush, was marching out to fight against him. When he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessor deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezeph and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar. Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpad? Where are the kings of Leir, Sepharavim, Hena and Iva? Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, of, the God of Israel says. Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word the Lord has spoken against him. Virgin daughter Zion despises and mocks you. Daughter Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have ridiculed the Lord. You have said, with my many chariots, I have ascended to the heights of the mountains, the uttermost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its junipers. 
I have re reached its remotest heights, the finest of its forest. I've dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago, I ordained it. In days of old, I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you have turned fortified cities into piles of stone. Their people drained of power are dismayed and put to shame. They're like plants in the field, like tender green roots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you are and when you come and go and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put a hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way you came. This will be the sign for you, Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramalek and Sharazir killed him with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Asar Shaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Did you enjoy that? making up those names <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, a long mm. a long reading and it's a long passage um, that you preached on obviously there was quite a lot that you had to leave out yes. because of time um, so just briefly remind us what you were preaching on on Sunday and then maybe we can mm. perhaps look at some of the bits you didn't have time for so we looked at it under three headings which was the um, the threat first of all the threat of um, uh, of, of Sennacherib and then the prayer of a believer which was um, Hezekiah and then finally the deliverance of, of God so that, that that's the kind of the structure I think what's interesting is uh, just standing back and looking at it we said because I preached this right at the start uh, as an introduction and we said that this is almost like a a a prism through which you see the whole uh, book. And I think the reason for that is that now having preached um, the first half of the book, we can see all the themes are coming together. Mm. So you've got themes here of, um, if you take God, the Holy One of Israel, the King of, of the whole earth. Well, very clear here. Um, uh, um, Snacker wants to make him out as just the little God of the little Jewish people and God says no I'm not I'm the God of the whole earth I'm not mm. just like any other God I am the living God um, you've got the the sense of um, the Jews uh, being the remnant this remnant language comes through again and again and here we see the remnant it's the, everybody else has been taken there's just these whoever's left in Jerusalem left um, and uh, uh, Assyria has come up again and again um, throughout the whole thing. It's been very much in the background of everything we've we've done, um, and then finally the, the promised deliverance of God. Trust me, and I will deliver you. Has mm. been has mm. what God's been saying again and again and again. Well, you see it. This is where it actually mm. happens. And I guess the response of um, the believer, King Hezekiah. We had Ahaz in chapter seven, yeah. didn't we? Who failed to trust God. Um, refused to trust God, and here we have um, Hezekiah, his son, yes. I think, yes. who is who is kind of the the, the model believer, de demonstrating faith in God. And mm. what does that faith look like? 
um, in a crisis. Mm. So yeah, so lots of big themes there. I was surprised reading it through. Um, Remnant is repeated a number of times, isn't it? Um, it's interesting when you read it out loud, you notice mm. things mm. Um, that you skip over um, in your head. So um, yeah, what 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 would you like to add in to, to the, the, the the kind of first um, section, the threat of evil? You you took that bigger didn't you um it was interesting you t you you um you you said that that basic this represents a bigger mm. that the ultimate threat mm. of evil um which is is sin and death and behind them of course our great enemy satan so yeah so do you want to just expand on that a yeah bit? i think it's very it's, it's really very very hard not to uh, kind of spiritualize the the passage and in a sense i think we're meant to um uh, you, you know, uh, John Bunyan basically uh, did that. He actually wrote a book about a city under siege, um, where Satan's coming to attack it, and there was ear gate and eye gate that. And, and so on. Okay. Yeah, not Pilgrim's Progress. No, another one. No, another one. Mm. I've got the name, and um, mm. it, it, it's kind of what you got here. Uh, the, the the field commander uh, who is speaking the words of the king of Assyria is proud and arrogant and we've seen that pride and arrogance in a number of the nations mm. before mm. And, and he's kind of like uh, distilling it down and I think who is the ultimate one who makes mm. threats against God's people it's Satan mm. Mm. and what are the weapons he uses death and evil um, and we find ourselves carrying in and his vehicle in, in, is words in, as well isn't yeah, it yeah it is so very much so yes, he uses, yes. uses words whether it's words that we hear mm. or words inside our heads um uh, and and that i think was a a thing i hadn't really I, if i suppose we're completely honest it was only as i was preaching it that it became mm. really clear mm. words is very important it's, it's all about words um because that that's the the challenge um against hezekiah right at the beginning you speak at verse five, chapter thirty-six. You speak only empty words. Um, it's just empty words. You're speaking empty words, and you're believing empty words. Just words. Mm. Look with your eyes and just see. We have power. Mm. We have feet on the ground. You've just got words, mm. and it's true. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. Yes, it's it's striking, isn't it? Um, he says in verse ten. Um, say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you mm. when he says. So he's, he is literally, he's saying you're depending on something that can't support you. And he's lying to you, mm. which, like you say, is, is mm. that you can you can smell the sulfur fumes mm. on that one, you can't can. you? Um, it comes straight from, from but, the evil one. But despite his boots on the ground, the field commander is using words. Yes. And, and because actually words are very, very powerful and he knows it. And so when they say, look, please, can you just, you know, it's a bit embarrassing because all the guys on the, on the walls can hear because they speak Hebrew. Could you just speak in um, Aramaic? He goes, no, I've come to speak to them as well. And then lifts up his voice mm. and goes, you so, guys are going to be eating your dung and drinking yes. your urine very soon. Yes. It's words. He's threatening. He's And they're scary. really scary, those yeah. words. Really frightening. And, and this is... Uh, national crisis it's a national crisis and for us what what is the scary thing it's words isn't mm, it um mm. words words are what goes around in our heads um it's an issue yes absolutely and and hezekiah again um his first um instinct is well it's repentance isn't mm. it repentance and grief he tears his clothes um and he goes um straight to the temple of the Lord mm. um, in order to hear, um, to, to, to consult with God, to hear God's word, um, I, I would imagine. Um, and then he goes to Isaiah um, to hear God's word from Isaiah as well. So yes. he's, doing, he's doing all the right things. It's interesting as well that he says in verse 4, it may be that yes. the Lord your God yes. will hear the words, these, these terrible words ridiculing him, and there he will be there's there's a kind of humility there isn't mm. there of you know god god might hear this and and he might respond but we we can't sort of tell him what to do and do you know the irony about that the real irony is the other person who says that i th i can't remember the date i think it's about three four hundred years earlier um is the king of assyria 
in Jonah. He oh, is, he's okay. exactly the same yes. kind of words. Yes. It, look, look, put on sackcloth and ashes, repent, it may turn be to that God. God will... Maybe he won't oh, relent. It's very, very Yeah, that's quite close, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So so this is the, the kind of the showdown and this is the, the huge kind of um huge nine eleven event. Isn't yes, it? This yes. is the event um that everybody would have remembered, the kind mm. of the crisis event. Um, just give us a little bit of the history, the background. Yeah. My understanding is um, Assyria had, they basically decimated most of the t- cities, the towns, and they'd got to Lachish. Yes. Um, and, and, and then the, the threat is that they'll come up to, to the walls of Jerusalem. Is there more that we need to know there? In no, the, not really. I mean, no. I, think, I think the important thing is that um, Snacker relatively new on the throne after his father's died king of assyria is the superpower they are the king of kings this is mm. this is language which is used a lot um, and king of kings means king of vassal kings so hezekiah and the other kings are are vassal kings right you, you can be king of judah we're very happy with that you rule it no problem at all but you pay us tribute so sort of puppet kings yeah and and they would be crushed if they so i think had um hezekiah had had been um been sort of looking elsewhere here hadn't he for to to rebel and so this is crushing crushing a rebellion here yeah and and i think there's a religious aspect to it because we know from chapter seven that his father made an alliance with Assyria and he shouldn't mm, have done mm. and i think and it's hard to know Hezekiah's heart, but I think he's throwing it off. And is he throwing it off because he's trusting in the living God and this is part of his trust? Or is he throwing it off because he's being a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be pushed around by any, mm. any Assyrian king. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, but he's leading the revolt. And so Snacrib sweeps down the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, just wiping out everybody, Tyre and Sidon gone, um, goes through Judah like a hot knife through butter, mm. just takes the towns and cities quickly. Lachish we know about because, of course, um, Sennacherib, when he went back, made a, an incredible relief that you can see in the British Museum to this day right. in his palace. Okay. And so that we can see, that's gone. Of, 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 um, of defeating his, Lachish. Yes, yeah. Sieged, destroying mm. it. And now he's come up to the walls of Jerusalem. And you've got to say, humanly speaking, this is curtains. Mm. I mean, it, it does, it makes me think of, of um, Ukraine and Russia and, you know, just basically walking straight yeah. into countries. And the, the fear and the terror, because these there were no, um, no sort of um, treating prisoners properly. The, none, of, none of those agreements were there. Um, this... Yeah, they. It was a terrible, terrible thing to fall under um, well, his so, power. So, Assyria brutal. is known. That they mm. are the most brutal nation, and, and interesting. We've. It's just been. There, there was talk about this just a couple of years ago. Um, archaeologists kind of confirming what the Bible says. Mm. I mean, outright confirming it. If you surrender to them, they will impale you on logs. They will flay you. Um, they will cut off your hands and they will decapitate you. Mm. Mm. That's if you surrender. If you don't surrender, you get worse. So it's, it's, it, if the Lord hadn't come to their aid, it would make Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem a few years later look like nothing. And Nebuchadnezzar's destruction was horrendous. The streets were flowing with blood. Mm. It would have been worse than that. So I think that's the... So really hard, humanly speaking, for Hezekiah to actually trust the promises of God that he was going to, the promises going back to Genesis, Mm. that he would make a people for himself in the place for himself and he would rule over them, those lovely promises Mm. in Genesis 12. And you just imagine, you know, what he must be thinking about that as as Jerusalem is about to be flattened and, and this remnant of God's people are about to be utterly destroyed. Really hard for him to hang on and trust uh, in, in those promises. And interestingly, I guess, as, as you've said, his, his faith is in God's promises. He's not just thinking, oh, well, you know, hopefully God will look with favour on us. He's actually trusting in promises God made to Abraham and Isaac 
and all the way down the generations, isn't he? Yeah, and I don't think he's doing a particularly good job of it, no. if, I, if I may say so. So, so actually, he does buckle. Yes. We know he buckles because Two Kings 18 tells us. And what he does is he first of all calls on Egypt. That's Hence, that's all the stuff that's come before. He sent treasure down to Egypt to try and get them to come and fight for him. Not really worked. And, um, you know, now uh, he's kind of sent out money to Snacker. Mm. Snacker has gone, why don't you send me some money? You know, maybe we can think about that. He's done that. Snacker has gone, yeah, no, I was just kidding. I'm going to mm. I'm gonna take Jerusalem. You need to surrender. Mm. So he's got, there's so he, nowhere else to turn. No, no. And, and again, I guess you can see echoes of that, can't you, in, in um, faith, in our faith as mm. well. As, as you can see that, can't you? So let's move on to the, the prayer mm. of the believer. Um, what really struck you about this? Well, I think it's the... Uh, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time discussing this beforehand because it's... And, 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 and I think this is quite famous, really, the idea that he gets the letter from Sennacherib who's had to withdraw because he's got to deal with verse 9, to, to Haka, the king of Cush. But he basically says, look, just stay there. It's all right, not forgotten about it. I'll be back very, very soon. And, I mean, that's gutting because they'd have woken up to see the troops peeling away, disappearing over the, the, um, the hills and been going, mm. Isaiah, your prayers have worked. This is great. I don't know why, but this is great. And then, you know, there's a knock at the door, a letter for... King Hezekiah, mm. and he reads, and he's like, oh, you're kidding me. So they will be back, yes. We're coming back. Yes. So so that's the, the ground of it. I, and I think I think he wasn't... I think when he, before he says, look, Isaiah, will you pray for us? I think he's a bit cross. Mm. You've got us into this. I, I was basing all my actions on what you said. And now, look, a fat lot of good that's done, Isaiah. Mm. Because you know. he's going to come back and destroy he's us. He's going to destroy us. Yeah. But, but no, it's, it's more we're, we're in the mess because of you. You're the one who encouraged me to rebel, I mm. think. Mm. I think okay. that's what's going through. So I think he's a bit cross. Um, and now, now that absolutely everything he's depending on has been stripped away, actually now he shows his, 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 his metal in terms of faith. Mm. And it's, he spreads out the letters before the Lord. It's him and God, basically, him and God. isn't it? Yeah. And and this lovely prayer, as you said, is so God-centred. And it's about God's glory, not about his comfort. You talked to us a bit about that, because I talked to you quite a bit about that. Um, how does that strike you, that prayer? Well, I, I guess it strikes me, um, it reminds me of the Lord's Prayer. You know, mm. our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, and so his primary prayer is for God's glory and really striking verse 20 yes. deliver us so that all kings of the earth may know that you Lord are the only God mm. so he's not praying primarily for his comfort and safety and the safety and comfort of his people but this it's a very God-centered prayer isn't oh, it it's, it's not about him uh, which I, again I think is is um, is very challenging mm. um, Really, really challenging. And and just the, the way that he comes and spreads it out before the Lord. So you talked a bit about uh, the attitude of the believer, um, you know, not just having a to-do list that we mm. kind of post through God's letterbox, but that actually this is very relational. Um, he comes to where the place where he can meet with God and he shares with God um, the trouble that, that he's in and how we can we can relate to that um, uh, Psalm 62 mm. uh, encourages us, us to pour out our hearts before God. That is the mark of, that is how you see faith. Uh, faith is demonstrated in bringing things to God in prayer. If we claim to have faith, but we never pray, um, then then we wonder what kind of faith that is. Faith is, is seen, demonstrated uh, in prayer. And, and I guess that's, that's the lesson here um, in, in what Hezekiah does. So yeah. Um, he comes, um, he's distraught and he comes to God, which I think is, is a wonderful encouragement, isn't it? I think the difficulty for us is um, God doesn't always, you know, send a, an army to um, destroy all our enemies, does he? I mean, he, you, you were pointing this ultimately to the last day when, when Satan will be finally 
um, gone. Uh, yes. But in the interim, um, it doesn't necessarily look like no, this. No, but I think it? it doesn't. And so there's no guarantee that God will answer. So you were reminding us uh, at the morning prayer and praise about uh, how um, believers in North Korea mm. uh, who have been meeting in underground churches uh, were in the last few months captured, all of them were killed, and their families were taken and put into concentration camps. Yeah. Where they are now. I mean, how do they read this? That, that must be very hard for them. Yeah, I think it is very hard because you'd be, you know, give ear, Lord, and hear, open your eyes, Lord, and see. Mm. Um, the answer is that God does not always answer our prayers as we would mm. we would like mm. um, and I think the question is are we willing to suffer and die for his kingdom mm. you know I'm reading through Acts at the moment and it's very striking isn't it that in um, uh, kind of at the beginning uh, James and Peter are put into prison James is put to the sword but an angel frees pres Peter from prison mm. Mm. one's put to the sword mm. one's released why yes. we don't know yes but it but it we do know it was all for god's kingdom as a result god's kingdom spread mm. you know the word of the lord increased the number of christians increased but we can't see god's purposes no. and and indeed this is chapter 37 is only a temporary um reprieve isn't mm. it so yes i guess from our perspective this is this is difficult and confusing to see uh, what's going on? I I found it helpful to to think about Jesus um, pouring out his mm. heart, spreading out his trouble um, before God, and yet praying, "Not my will, but yours be done." And and again, that's a very good um, that 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 is kind of the ultimate prayer of of the faithful believer um, in his heavenly Father, isn't it? And mm. and God doesn't rescue him. Um, does God doesn't rescue him either, does he? Because he has a greater purpose. Um, he allows Jesus to go to the cross because he has a greater purpose mm. uh, to rescue us. Mm. But I, I do think um, that's important. You talked about kind of the anxiety, the, the problems that we have, and you're kind of shaking the bottle mm. rather than... What do you think stops you um, spreading your heart out before the Lord? Because we know, we know this is what we need to do. But what do you think are the, the things that stop you doing this? Well, I think I'm not too dissimilar from Hezekiah. That I think what Hezekiah has been saying uh, basically up until now is, it's all right, God, I've got this. Mm. I'll, I'll make your will happen by making an alliance with Egypt or paying off Sennacherib. And it's only when none of that works out that he goes I'm, I'm desperate so I think for me it's pride it's, mm. it's arrogance I don't pray because I'm arrogant I think I by my great power and mighty strength can make everything happen sort of working through your to-do list you can yeah, yeah you can you can kind of influence things and, and, and the danger is in our heads we've got this kind of okay so it's either me completely working hard and not praying mm. or me just praying and not working hard and the truth is I need to work hard and pray. Mm. Um, and those two things actually go remarkably well mm. together. Mm. In fact, I tend to work much better when I when the anxiety is gone because I've yes. prayed, if that makes yes. any sense, rather than the desperate clawing. Yes, that's when you kind of, you can make silly decisions. And be, and and be manipulative. Be very stressed, yeah. You know, easily, because yeah. it's all down to me. I've got to make this happen. Hor yes. It's horrible. So pride, I think time as well. Time, yeah. We, we think it's more effective to, to get on and do stuff than to actually, because spreading your heart up before the Lord, spreading... Hmm. It, it takes time, doesn't it? It takes slowing down and thinking about what's going on. It, it, I guess, I guess it's reorientating, you know, what I need and what I'm scared about, and I'm thinking about it in the bigger picture, which takes time. Of mm. actually, you know, I'm here for the Lord. That this is about Him. It's not about me. Um, so, so all those things take time. And, and activism. I mean, it's similar to what I said earlier, but it's, it's slightly different. I think the thought that real work happens yeah when i do something yes 
Um, whereas real work, if I'm, I'm, pr I'm just praying. Well, no, I mean, really, really interesting. I can't remember the quote, but Hudson Taylor, you know, uh, talks about learning um, to move men through prayer. Yeah. And and it you can see that with Hudson Taylor. I mean, mm. you know, um, his work was built. The work mm. that he did mm. was built on prayer. And I think we want that to be the case, don't yes, we? Yes. But absolutely. we don't believe it. We've got to believe yes. that, that, that it is worth praying. Yes. Otherwise we won't, will we? No. We will do other things. Um, so that, that, again, that's a very helpful um, illustration of, of um, the life of, of the believer. And then this extraordinary deliverance. Yes. Um, tell, us, tell us about that. Well, I think he's, um, you know, uh, Isaiah prays and... God says, because you have prayed to me, verse 21, concerning Sennacher, king, king of Israel, uh, this is the word that's spoken against him. I don't think it's because you prayed, I'm going to do this. I wasn't going to do it before you prayed. I think it's more that because you prayed, I'm going to let you in on what's mm. happened, mm. what's going to happen. And very simply, two parts to it. Number one, I'm going to judge this man and this mm. nation. Um, and number two, I will deliver you and the remnant. Um, I think that's how it's split up. So the first part is um, is verse twenty-two. Is that the first the yeah, first bit yeah. of poetry, twenty-two to twenty-nine? Yeah. Um, and again, the the pictures that God uses um, of yeah about the 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 trees. Um, the, the, this is the pride. Um, this is the pride of, of Assyria, isn't it? And God will, um, God will bring him down. Um, it, interesting, verse 26, long ago I ordained it. Yes. In days of old I planned it. This is all under God's sovereign power and will. Mm. It's not a new thing. No. God hasn't just gone, oh my word, the king of Syria has caught me, mm. caught me out. Yeah. Um, this was always God's plan um, all the way along. And again, really... Powerful poetry, verse 27, the people drained of power, they're ineffective, they're put to shame, and they're like plants that are, are dying and scorched. Um, that, that is what yeah. God So is. that's what we've seen from Isaiah before, these, yeah. these, these word language. I think what's fascinating is how it begins and ends that section. So virgin daughter Zion despises and mocks you. Yes. She tosses her head as you flee. You know, that's how it starts. And then at the end... I know where you are. Mm. I mean, that's quite, you know... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, that's quite abstract. You know, I know where you are. I know where you live. Mm. Uh, I know when you come and go and how you rage against me. So I know your yes. heart. So, so by attacking God's people, Assyria is actually mm. attacking God, uh, mm. which, again, I guess we, the persecuted church, you know, when, when the enemies of God's people attack that they are in a very dangerous position because they are actually attacking God and, and raging against him. It's much bigger yes. than, than just the human, um, yeah, the human beings they think they're against. And then the sign for Hezekiah? Yeah, and the sign is simply that... Um, uh, it, it, so if you imagine uh, these troops have... Uh, are, are like locusts around Jerusalem. Yes. They have just devastated the crop yes so this year you'll eat what grows by itself just you know bits mm. of wheat that you can grab and forage mm. for um but then basically it's a kind of a building and a mm. growing and eventually you're going to sow and reap your blunt vineyards eat their fruit mm. um so you you know that the, the sign for you is that you will have a crop to yes to harvest and and eat again again i guess we miss that in our society don't we that it's all about um, their, their survival is based mm. on, on what they can grow uh, and on the crops. So God will be at work providing for him, for them, and, and they will be settled again. Again, this remnant. Um, remnant language and zeal yes. of the Lord will accomplish yes. this verse 32. We've had that before yes. in chapter 9. And that the remnant is, is basically that those faithful to God? Uh, yes, it's those who remain faithful to God. Uh, they've been called Emmanuel, you know, God with us, mm. um, right back at the beginning. And they are the, this idea of the floodwaters of Assyria going up to the neck. Mm. Well, all that's left is the head mm. 
and they are the head, the remnant yes. is the head, if you like, that's just left. Yes. Lots of pictures of who these people are. God really wants them to, to know that he's going to do this, yes. isn't it? He will not enter this city, verse 33. He will not come. Um, he will not enter this city. I will defend this city and save it. Again, that reminds me of um, gospel promises that we have in, in Jesus, Romans 8. Um, you know, that, that nothing can separate us mm. from his love. He will... Um, he will rescue us. God really wants them to know this, um, and I guess that's where we we have to um, we have to, to take that to the gospel promises that we mm. have in Christ, rather than that God will keep us safe in this life in this world. Um, that that's where these promises relate to us, isn't it? It's through the cross. It, it is, and I think by you know spiritualizing it, often that's not the right thing. To, but I think it is the right mm. thing to do here. You, you know, Hezekiah is safe because he is in the city, mm. and uh, we are safe because we're in Christ. Mm. Um, it's a it's a beautiful picture, really. Um, so all the forces of evil kind of assail against us, but we're safe because we're in Christ. Because we're in Christ. One of the things we said. Um, a few weeks ago, I was preaching in the evening. I deliberately preached on Psalm 46, but mm. I didn't realise when I chose it that mm. actually it's it's probably either written by Hezekiah or written about this time. Yes. And this sense of, uh, you know, at the beginning that um, the mountains are falling into the heart of the sea mm. and God is our only refuge. And then the picture shifts and you've got Jerusalem with this river running through it. Mm. And it's, it's what you've got here. And then the picture shifts again and God just lifts his voice and the nations are quiet. Yes. Well, that's what we're coming to here. Yes, he breaks the bow and shatters the sea. Yeah. He literally does that with the Assyrian yeah. army. Yeah. And, and I think it's, you could say verse 36, you know, the angel of the Lord went up to 185,000 the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they're all dead bodies. Mm. You know, it's kind of be still and know that I'm God. Yes. It's kind of like be quiet. Yes. Um, God speaks. Yes. So how do we, our focus is very much, as, as you know, we're human beings, mm. is very much on the troubles of this life. And those are the things that drive us to prayer. Um, how do we practically have a more God-focused um, God-centered kind of desire for His glory, rather than, you know, the the things that are on my worry list each day, tend not to be God's glory and His kingdom and His will being done. How how would you? How do we move? Obviously, those things are important, and we do need to bring them to God. But how do we move towards a more God-centered way of praying and living? Um, well, I think. I, I think I want to be honest and just say I don't think I've been very good at this. And actually, it was, um, in fact, preaching this passage right at the start of Isaiah that brought me up short mm. and made me realise that incrementally I've become, it's almost like I've become more and more like this. Yes. Um, and what Isaiah did was just help me to look up, right? See God. So, yeah. so there's a clue, isn't it? Um, let's read the Word of God. Yes. And, and yeah. let's branch into things like the Old Testament, which I think um, also help us to... Personally, what I found helpful, I think, is two things. One is I deliberately now pray in the Lord's Prayer every day mm. Uh, mm. because precisely what you said at the start, you know, your your name, your kingdom, your will, I'm praying that every day. And I don't, when I say praying the Lord's Prayer, I don't just mean, you know, our Father, our art and her, you know, I'm not just going through a mere recitation. I'm trying to think about mm. what that means. And the, the whole first bit of it is, mm. Lord, in everything I do today, can it, can it be about your name and your kingdom mm. and your will and not about my name and my kingdom Absolutely. And my will? So it must start with prayer, yeah. mustn't it? And just resting on that, our Father who art in heaven, just kind of, again, like you say, pausing over that yes. rather than just kind of yes. saying it, um, just reorientates us, doesn't it? So we need that constant reorientation, don't we? We kind of automatically make it about me. Um, and we need to be reorientated. Older Christians are great at helping with that as well, aren't they? Uh, but no, it's it's just useful to think that. So, so prayer, uh, praying God-centered prayers, reading God's word, remembering actually what is true, and and the witness of of, of other Christians. And I, you know, on the prayer side, I think uh, we, we have arguments about this, about whether our prayers should be 
extempor you know we just we make up those prayers as the spirit leads us or whether they should be written down or or even prayers of older saints and yes. the answer is both yes all both. of them yeah um and so personally i try and pray both but one of the things again i've tried to do is to pray some of the prayers of older mm. christians who, mm. you know and those tend to be god-centered yeah so if we take the book of common prayer um uh, you know the, the anglican churches have for many years those are god-centered prayers yes absolutely and we and and so the more i learn from that the more i then tend to pray that myself yes. well you can go the whole hog then and go well what are the best prayers to pray the psalms and the yeah. psalms will teach yeah. me again that they're, they're that lovely blend of honesty and spreading out our hearts before god yes. but trusting him yeah. and and it's almost an anticlimax, isn't it? Yes, it really uh, verse is. Verse 36, so there's yeah. all this trouble and yeah. turmoil and terror. Mm. Um, and then in, in kind of three verses, this incredible enemy. Again, it reminds me a little bit about, you know, Jesus's death on the cross. Mm. That in a couple of simple verses, you know, Satan has been defeated. And um, yeah, he, his power over us has, has been, has, is gone um so god has no this isn't difficult for god to do i no. think sometimes we sort of think we're kind of you know we need to help god um to to defeat evil and actually it's not a problem for god at all this is just this is not a big thing it's not difficult for him uh, uh, to, the, to destroy the enemy there is an issue here because uh, it's different again people look and go what god kills a hundred and eighty five thousand men just like that how can he do that that's not right and it's kind of like yeah I, under I understand that but you're looking at it from a very privileged position if you were shut up in that city you're just one of the you know the ordinary people facing a long siege where you're going to end up having to choose do i eat my children or not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right um and then the, the gates finally are breached, the walls are breached, and you get these people coming in who want to do horrendous things to you. Mm. And suddenly you, you, you're you told, just go and look out the window, and they've all been killed. You're not going to be going there going, oh, I'm not sure God should have done that. No, you're You're just really going to be rejoicing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is where we've got it slightly wrong. I, I, yeah, I can't explain all of that, but... But God is doing what is good and right. These are not nice people. No. You don't want to have them for no, tea. they don't. They, yeah, it is justice, isn't it? It's justice. Yeah, yeah. No, well, thank you, Andy. Anything else you want to add into this? We've got chapter 38 and 39. We do, which will be next a challenge. Week. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it ends obviously with Snackerib himself being killed. And, and there's just an irony. It's 20 years later. Um, you kind of think, oh, maybe God's forgotten about this. Yes. But the irony is he's worshipping his God, the God who apparently is greater than all the other gods, and he's sitting in front of him, and his sons come and kill him mm. because he threatened to put his youngest son on the throne. Um, it's just kind of like, yeah, your God really cannot help. He isn't that great, is no, he? No, compared to Hezekiah yeah. uh, worshipping his God. So, no, thank you, Andy. Thank you. That's great. Uh, we'll be back again uh, next week um, after the next sermon. And that will be um, this big section of, of Isaiah finished. Thanks very much.